As World War II was drawing to a close, the soldiers from the 42nd Rainbow Division arrived in the Bavarian village of Dachau, anticipating an encounter with a deserted facility used for training Adolf Hitler's elite SS troops or possibly a prisoner of war camp. However, the reality they encountered left an indelible mark on their memories for the remainder of their lives. They came across heaps of starved bodies, numerous train carriages overflowing with the decomposed remains of humans, and perhaps the most harrowing sight of all, the thousands of emaciated individuals who had miraculously endured the atrocities of Dachau, the first and most enduring concentration camp established by the Nazis. Virtually all the soldiers, from higher-ranking generals to the lowliest privates, lacked any real understanding of what they would encounter in a concentration camp. They were unaware of the extreme conditions, the extent of enslavement, oppression, and the atrocities committed by the Nazis, states John McManus, a U.S. military history expert at the Missouri University of Science and Technology and author of Hell Before Their Very Eyes. U.S. Soldiers Liberate Concentration Camps in Germany, April 1945. He described the discovery as astounding. The capture of Dachau by U.S. forces on April 29, 1945, wasn't the inaugural liberation by the Allies. Earlier, Soviet forces had uncovered and liberated the remnants of Auschwitz and other extermination camps. Nevertheless, the harrowing visuals and direct accounts from the stunned liberators of Dachau conveyed the full extent of the Holocaust's horrors to the American public. Dachau's transformation into a template for Nazi concentration camps Dachau's establishment in 1933 was overseen by the infamous Nazi leader Heinrich Himmler, who declared it as the first concentration camp for political prisoners. Initially, Dachau functioned as a labor camp for those deemed adversaries of the National Socialist Nazi regime, including trade unionists, communists, and democratic socialists, later expanding to incarcerate Roma, gypsies, homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Jews. The ruthless efficiency of Dachau was largely due to SS officer Theodor Eich, who implemented a policy of dehumanization characterized by forced labor, physical punishment, lashings, food deprivation, and the immediate execution of any escape attempts. The inmates of Dachau endured harsh conditions, dismantling a vast World War I-era munitions factory and constructing the barracks and administrative buildings that would become the primary training facility for the SS. The inmates themselves were forced to construct what was misleadingly called their protective custody camp, a grimly named concentration camp within the expansive Dachau complex. This area, comprising 32 dismal barracks, was encircled by an electrified barbed wire fence, a moat, and seven watchtowers. The prisoners endured horrific medical experiments, including injections with malaria and tuberculosis. Countless died due to the grueling labor or torture, and their bodies were typically incinerated in the camp's own crematorium. The Iron Gate leading into the concentration camp, separating it from the rest of Dachau, bore the cynically ironic inscription, Arbeit macht frei, work sets you free. Dachau's operational success led to the promotion of Ike to the role of inspector general for all German concentration camps, establishing Dachau as the standard template. Following the Kristallnacht, Night of Broken Glass, pogrom, where Jewish synagogues, businesses, and homes were devastated by Nazi gangs throughout Germany, an increasingly large number of Jews were detained at Dachau. On the brink of the camp's liberation by American forces, Dachau's records showed 67,665 registered prisoners, with about a third of them being Jewish. The initial indication for the American infantrymen, unsuspecting as they entered Dachau in late April 1945, of the atrocities ahead was an overpowering odor. Some of the soldiers speculated that they were near a chemical plant, while others likened the pungent scent to burning feathers from a plucked chicken. This was an experience for which their prior combat exposure had not prepared them. Weeks before their arrival, Nazi officials at Buchenwald, another infamous German concentration camp, had crammed at least 3,000 prisoners into 40 train cars. Their intent was to conceal these prisoners from the advancing Allied forces. The journey, intended to be brief, stretched into a three-week nightmare. Tragically, only a fraction of the train's 3,000 passengers survived the majority succumbing to starvation, dehydration, asphyxiation, and disease. 
Those who did survive were forced into the concentration camp, while the railway cars were left strewn with thousands of deceased prisoners. John McManus notes, for a U.S. soldier arriving at Dachau, the sight of the death train would likely be the first gruesome encounter. The horrifying scenes and odors emanating from the death train left numerous American soldiers physically ill and emotionally distraught, but this was merely a prelude to the further atrocities they would encounter within the camp itself. In the weeks before liberation, Nazis had transported prisoners from all over Germany and even from distant Auschwitz to Dachau. These prisoners, like the few survivors from the Buchenwald death train, arrived emaciated and plagued with diseases such as typhus. The Dachau guards squeezed these new inmates into already overpopulated barracks, forcing as many as 1,600 men into spaces meant for 250. Starvation and rampant diseases swiftly claimed the lives of thousands in the days leading up to liberation. Although the Nazis attempted to cremate as many bodies as possible before abandoning Dachau, the number of deceased was overwhelming. Additionally, about 7,000 Dachau inmates, predominantly Jews, were forced on a lethal march to Tejern Sea in the south. During this march, those who fell behind were executed, and thousands more perished from sheer exhaustion. Upon entering the camp, the American soldiers were confronted with heaps of lifeless bodies, naked and emaciated. The soldiers repeatedly described seeing the deceased stacked like cordwood, a phrase that, while illustrative, inadvertently stripped the victims of their lingering humanity. For the soldiers, perceiving these bodies as once fully human was an overwhelming burden at that moment. John McManus comments, you're faced with this unimaginable sight of bodies, individuals on the brink of death, or in such advanced stages of emaciation, that it's beyond comprehension. When the soldiers of the 45th Thunderbird Division of the American Army encountered the death train at Dachau, it triggered an uncontrollable response. These men had endured 500 days of continuous combat, thinking they had seen the worst war had to offer. However, the sight of this train, filled with the lifeless bodies of innocents, their eyes and mouths seemingly pleading for mercy, was beyond anything they had experienced. The emotional impact was profound. Some American soldiers broke down in tears, while others were consumed by intense anger. In a moment of fury, when four German officers appeared from the woods, surrendering with a white handkerchief, Lieutenant William Walsh led them into one of the boxcars filled with dead bodies and shot them with his pistol. As the gravely injured Germans cried out in pain, other American GIs completed the deadly task. The situation inside Dachau escalated further. An estimated group of 50 to 125 SS officers and various German military personnel, including medical staff, were corralled in a coal yard. Lieutenant Walsh, seeking a machine gun, rifles, and a Tommy gun operator, prepared for further action. As the soldiers loaded ammunition into the machine gun, the German prisoners stood and started moving towards their captors. It was then that Walsh is said to have drawn his pistol and given the order to fire. In a brief but intense 30-second burst of gunfire, at least 17 German prisoners were killed in the Dachau coal yard. John McManus, a scholar who has extensively studied these events, emphasizes the rarity of such actions by American soldiers during the numerous liberations across different locations. He attributes this unique occurrence to the leadership dynamics. The critical difference lies in leadership. Here, you had a company commander deeply traumatized by the atrocities he witnessed, leading to a complete breakdown in his judgment. When a leader succumbs to such emotional turmoil, it's likely that the soldiers will follow suit, McManus explains. The challenge for the liberators extended beyond confronting the horrors of the camp, they also faced difficulties in aiding the survivors. The approximately 32,000 surviving prisoners in Dachau were in such a dire state of malnutrition and sickness that they resembled walking skeletons. Suffering from typhus and lice, these emaciated survivors clung to their liberators, scarcely believing their ordeal was ending. However, the American soldiers, untrained and ill-equipped to deal with such severe cases of starvation, unwittingly exacerbated the situation. They offered their own sea rations and Hershey bars to the famished prisoners, who consumed the food voraciously. Unfortunately, their weakened bodies were unable to process the solid food, leading to tragic consequences.
Even decades after the liberation, many soldiers who were part of the Dachau operation carried a heavy burden of guilt, observes John McManus. Their initial reaction of disgust upon encountering the prisoners, followed by their well-intentioned but harmful acts of overfeeding, weighed heavily on them. In their eagerness to help, they inadvertently caused harm, a phenomenon often described as killing them with kindness. Adding to this complex emotional landscape was the stark reality that the American soldiers could not immediately allow the freed prisoners to leave Dachau. The survivors needed extensive medical care and nourishment to recover, a process that would span months. Furthermore, there was the challenge of finding a destination for these individuals once they were healthy enough to leave. Particularly poignant was the plight of Jewish survivors. After enduring the horrors of Dachau, many found themselves in displaced persons camps, sometimes for years, before they could secure permission to move to countries like the United States, the UK, or Palestine. This prolonged state of limbo only added to the tragedy of their experiences. The American GIs who played a role in liberating Dachau were present at the camp for only a brief period, typically a few days, before they were reassigned to other missions. The responsibility for caring for the survivors fell to combat medical units. Meanwhile, engineering teams were tasked with the somber duties of burying the deceased and cleaning up the camp. News of the horrors discovered at places like Dachau and Buchenwald quickly spread among the Allied forces. As a result, numerous soldiers and officers made their way to these concentration camps in the days and weeks following liberation, determined to witness firsthand the extent of Nazi atrocities. Adolf Hitler's suicide, occurring just a day after the liberation of Dachau, signaled the impending end of the war. Yet, for many soldiers, visiting Dachau reframed their understanding of the conflict. They realized they were not merely combating an enemy nation, they were confronting the very essence of evil. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, accompanied by Generals George Patton and Omar Bradley, visited the Order of Concentration Camp on April 12, 1945, a week following its liberation. Eisenhower seemed to anticipate future skepticism and denial regarding the Holocaust. He stated, the things I saw beggar description. The visual evidence and the verbal testimony of starvation, cruelty and bestiality were so overpowering as to leave me a bit sick. I made the visit deliberately in order to be in a position to give first-hand evidence of these things if ever, in the future, there develops a tendency to charge these allegations merely to propaganda. This foresight underscored the importance of direct observation and documentation, encountering potential future denial or minimization of these horrific events.